Hello and welcome to this live streamed interview with HarperCollins Children's Books. My name is Tanya Brennan-Drope and I'm here with international best-selling author and illustrator Lauren Child. Lauren is the creator of the hugely successful Charlie and Lola Pitch books, which have now been uh, turned into a TV show. She's also the author and illustrator of the Clarice Bean series, and in 2009, she started a whole new world for her fans to explore, aimed for both boys and girls, with a brand new character and a whole new set of truly awesome skills. Ruby Redfort is her name, and so far there have been four books in the series, Look Into My Eyes, Take Your Last Breath, Catch Your Death, and Feel the Fear. Lauren, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. Um, when did you realise that you first wanted to tell stories? Mm. Oh, well, it was an accident, really. Um, I'd always been uh, a drawer. That's what I loved doing. I loved drawing and making things. I didn't especially want to become a storyteller because I didn't think it was any special skill of mine. But... What happened was it was very difficult to get any work as an illustrator and so I just started writing and again I didn't really want to become an illustrator, I really <laughs> wanted to become um, a filmmaker, I wanted to to oh, really? come up with an idea that would be a lovely um, animation, perhaps an animated film, maybe a live action film and so I wrote a book called Clarice Bean That's Me which was a picture book and it was really written to show somebody that I could write a story and design design the sets and the characters so the drawing came first the drawing came that first the definitely yeah um tell me about the the new writing direction into ruby because obviously there have been so much beautiful books that you've produced before the, the, the series came about so i'd love to know where that where that first started for you um the process that really started with um my clarice bean books which is clarice went from being a picture book character um to sort of chapter books that got and Clarice got older and older as they went so we started with Clarice being seven in the picture books and she ends up as being probably 11 12 in the novels mm. and Ruby was a character in the Clarice Bean novels because I wanted Clarice Bean to be passionate about a series of books that her teacher doesn't approve of because because <laughs> Clarice is reading this this these books about um uh, a sort of secret agent mm. who's also an American school kid and her teacher doesn't think they're they're worth reading and she shouldn't read them thinks they're pointless yes yeah and and so I wrote lots of ruby extracts within the Clarice Bean novels and then I started getting letters from readers saying oh they sound really interesting could you could you write the ruby redfoot books that oh, is okay. interesting. So it really was a transition. It was quite smooth in that sense to have the starting point of Ruby within the Clarice. Yes, it started books. that way, and they started really silly. So if you read the <laughs> Clarice Bean books, they're they're really really silly, um, kind of pulp fiction type stories, and um, and they're meant to be kind of a bit trashy. And then when it, when I when I started writing the Ruby books, I realised I couldn't do that because it would be very boring to write and very very boring to read, and so I had to age ruby up she's older yes and she's like a teenager and and the the plotting is much harder than i imagined it was going to be so tell me a little bit about ruby's world because it's um, just so vivid and rich ruby's world is really based on my love of american tv and film when i was a child and in a lot of american um television series they the the children seem to live these great lives where they would be doing all these amazing things. So sometimes they would be swimming and, and surfing. <laughs> and other times yeah. they would be skiing or, or rock exotic. climbing. Yeah. Or, and, and so America just seemed to have everything because we saw this America that wasn't actually set anywhere. It was just America at large. And I thought it would be really nice to set a character in that world. So Ruby's world is everything. It's San Francisco, it's New York, it's LA, it's it's a small sleepy town in the in the Midwest. It's it's anywhere. So um I thought that would allow Ruby to do anything that I need her to do. So it she has every kind of scenery. It's perfect. It's a yeah. perfect platform. <laughs> um despite being a child, she is um the most adult of all the grown ups, I think that's fair to say. She has 
a bucket load of sass. Mm. She's totally competent and incredibly smart. Um, and I know that when in the past you've said that she, the voice of her was in your head when you were writing. Mm. So talk, talk me through that process to, to hear her voice in, in your head must have been quite an interesting one. Yeah, well, I tend to do that actually probably with most of my characters, but I think Ruby, the Ruby Redford series is, is a little bit different in that I, I completely see it as a film because when I was writing for Clarice, Ruby was also a film that Ru- that Clarice was really excited about. It was coming out as a movie. And so I see it very much as a movie. And in that way, there's it's a lot... It's very filmic. Of, it's very filmic. Yeah. And there's a lot of... Um, snappy dialogue Mm. and domestic comedy and then there's also a lot of action and action is quite difficult to write and get across so I watched a lot of films so Mm. that I'm more in it than I would normally be I'm I'm sort of trying to imagine myself watching a film and how would it feel if I was that character and 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 get across almost describing a film to the reader so I think that's why her voice is very very clear in my head and I and I think a lot about um uh Jodie Foster because when when I was when I was um growing up Jodie Foster was the really big name child actor she's now obviously a grown-up and um (laughs) and she's probably around my age actually but at the time she was she was like no other child actor in that she she was so believable Yes, and, and she really was the starting point in, in lots of ways, wasn't she? When when you see her on screen, you thought, God, that is, you know... Yeah, because she's, she's she, she doesn't come across as a girl. Mm. She comes across as a person. Mm. And so th- um, generally they don't... When, when Jodie Foster was in a film, they didn't play into that whole girl film, boy yes. film. She's a character and she can hold a film. And... Um, and I loved that about her, and and probably um, people probably might best know her from Bugsy Malone, I should think, because she's wonderful in Bugsy Malone. She but is. I saw her in all kinds of things from the first Freaky Friday, which is great film. Probably where I really um, yeah uh, fell in love with her acting style. I think. And she she strikes a chord with both boys and girls. I think that's really yeah. the key, isn't it? Yes. And she has these great friendships. They were very good in those days of making kind of boy-girl friendships, yeah. which are just based on being friends and great banter. So you're often find she has she's she's sort of sort of paired with a boy character, and they really hit it off in yeah. that sort of banter way, which is what I was trying to get across in Ruby. Um, so not only do you write, I mean, you just said you illustrate your books as well, and that was the first sort of passion for you was drawing. Um, you know, we've does it come naturally to you? I know that in the past we've talked about, you know, people that we love, like Myra Kalman, for example, whose work is just wonderful. Mm. She's a famous illustrator. She writes fantastic children's books. Um, and she's described it as a fluidity between pictures and words. And mm. I think that definitely strikes a chord with you, doesn't it? Yes. I, I remember seeing her, her books for the first time when I went to New York. And what I loved is her using... Um, text to illustrate so you use the words as part of the illustration it's not separate to she sees the beauty of of fonts typefaces and things so that you you pick the you pick the typeface that suits your Mm. your story and um but she does it in such a in your face way that's what I really enjoy about her there's no apology for the for the words creeping through the picture it's all part of it it's all one yeah, and that's lovely because it's actually a very strong image and there's no apologies. As yeah, there's no said, keeping it all n- yeah, neat and absolutely. tidy at the bottom. Which is yeah. fantastic. Um, and I know that, obviously, when we have these fantastic books in front of us and uh, when we're getting our ideas together, I'm sure there are lots of children who are watching now who are thinking about, you know, they, they probably love art and they love taking art and also, you know, English and writing stories. But I know that when you're taking art, teachers obviously encourage you to note things down in sketchbooks to mm. get your ideas down on, on pages. So yeah. um, how, for kids that are tuned into the show now and watching, is that something that you do regularly? Would you encourage children, if they love drawing, to, to, to start their ideas down on, on a sketchbook? I think do it however, however you however you do it so yeah. it's whether it's writing something on the back of an envelope or in the back of your 
exercise book or that's a good or, tip actually an yes envelope. i know like because that. often i don't have a sketchbook with me and i hear lots of illustrators saying oh i always take my my sketchbook i usually have forgotten mine or it's too big or it didn't fit in my bag <laughs> or something's happened and if i have an idea or i or i see somebody that i quickly want to draw i i'll use anything that's to hand sometimes it's a book you know that you Brilliant. happen to have with you so i don't and just think scribble it, away and yeah Lovely. And sometimes it's just writing words down as well to remind me of something. It doesn't always have to be a drawing. And sometimes if you if you describe somebody in words, then you can go back and remember what they look like and then draw them. Yes, and actually that does remind me of something that, again, Myra mm. said, which is she's not an illustrator or an author, she's a reporter, which I think is... That's a brilliant way, and I've never thought of saying that, but I think she's right, because I, I often get asked, and you're, you're having to sort of limit yourself to one or the other, and actually I think, I think that is exactly what she does. It's a perfect description of her, um, because I always feel she's beautiful with words. She uses language so perfectly, and wonderful with her illustration observation so she needs them both together as are you with these books well, thank it's beautiful. you <laughs> um what i love about um the books lauren as well is is the message that you give out to kids which that it's it's great to be clever it's it's not a bad thing you can be a geek and you can still be cool and ruby definitely um embodies that um how important was it for you to get that balance right between the super cool and the super well geek? i think I hope that I also get across that there's all kinds of clever. Yeah. So so Ruby is a very particular kind of clever. She's the kind of clever that does very well at school and finds everything easy. Clancy is someone who is also very clever, but in yes. a sort of sideways way, in a way that doesn't necessarily um, work at school, because I think we all have different um, sorts of clever, and sometimes our kind of clever doesn't fit with exams and... and and finding school easy and Clancy is has fantastic intuition which is actually a most brilliant skill mm. if you can read people and re you know sort of just have a sense of what might be going on in a situation so you can be sensitive to something or you can preempt an argument because you know it's it's kind of boiling yes and, and that is so definitely a skill. yeah I think it is a real skill and so I wanted to bring in all those different ideas that that whilst Ruby is a fantastic kind of languages and science and code breaking and all these other things other other children are, are, are also in her sort of in her friendly set are also yes. good at other things what would you say you were at school you were Ruby or a Clancy. Oh, definitely. I, I was, I, I was good at something. I was, I was, I, I could do some things really well, but not other things, you know. So it's just, it's, I, it sometimes boils down to your interests mm. as well. I was always interested in historical things, and I loved how you could look back at something and see how history repeats and how there's a pattern in history that you keep on seeing and it keeps going through through time and yes because that's also incredibly visual actually really yeah strong it in is terms of narrative it is so I think those sort of things I was very interested in um and I think I wasn't I wasn't very good at maths in the conventional way but I think once I got beyond school I began to see also how that's patterns and how maths comes into art and maths comes into music and yes. I think had I been taught those things at school I would have found it much more easy to latch on to it as a subject well, that's at the perfect segue to mm -hmm. the next question, uh, which is that Ruby's a secret agent. Um, she loves a good puzzle. She loves mm. cracking codes. Um, and for anyone that doesn't know this already, for anyone who's watching, um, you asked the mathematician, very famous mathematician, Marcus de Sautoy, to get involved in developing these beautiful codes. Mm. Um, and they're up on the screen now. Um, and it's a genius idea. Um, and I love that idea of collaboration that, mm. that you struck up with him, Lauren. So tell me about that process. What was it like to work work with him? Um, that w it was incredibly necessary to work with him because I realised that I'd, I'd sort of written myself into a corner by saying that Ruby was this, you know, incredible code maker and code breaker, and then to convince the reader that she's really good at, at coding she 
That's like another level, isn't yes, it? Yes, it's got like to another level. And she's a genius. <laughs> I'm not a genius. How do I how do I get that across when you're reading the, the books? Mm. And so I I spoke to my um, publisher about it, and I said I think we need a genius because otherwise I, <laughs> I'm not going to convince anyone that Ruby's a genius. And she, it was her that came up with the idea of Marcus. We we talked through all these different different possible people we might be able to collaborate with and it was her genius idea of him because I know that he's very interested in getting children interested in maths um, and how you can explain um, maths to children in a really interesting way so that they grasp it. Yes there are lots of different ways to identify yeah. with maths. And he always and... says that he wasn't very good at maths as a child. Oh really? Yes oh, and I think and that's a lovely that's a lovely sort of link for me for to to my reader because you don't have to be brilliant to begin with yeah. you just have to be interested and and there's something very interesting about codes because they are puzzles and it, yeah, that, they are. The puzzles are a bit like magic and um, so I asked him if he could come up with codes that were based on different senses because the six ruby books are based on yes. the six senses yes. and, um, and so I think the smell one was the hardest one to do and I think that was quite a challenge for him the, the, so the, there was some even some yeah. stumbling blocks for him <laughs> well it's really do difficult because in an ideal world you would have given the reader lots and lots of different bottles oh, of scent to sniff yeah. and they would have been able to understand what it was that yes. Ruby was was taking taking, taking in, in. But we couldn't do that, sadly, and and so he had to show everything in in molecules, and so it's it's less easy to explain. But it's wonderful for the development of kids as well to understand, you know, aspects of molecules mm. and chemistry, yeah. and it yeah. just opens up a whole new world into things that they might love and fall in love with later. Um, Ruby's expressions, I just think, are fabulous. The one-liners, the serious corkers that you've managed mm. to write in there. Um, excuse me while I yawn, I think mm. is one that I particularly love. Mm. Um, and let's not forget the very simple but completely hilarious bozo, which is just mm. lovely. Encountering phrases like that and the language that you wanted Ruby to possess um, reminds me a lot of what you were talking about earlier with the 70s shows. And I know you were saying that you have a massive love of film. Mm. You also have a huge love. I know he's a big inspiration of yours, the famous film director Alfred Hitchcock. Mm -hmm. um, and you grew up watching his films too. Um, it it kind of strikes a chord with me that Ruby is not just a book, it's a thriller. Mm -hmm. They're comic thrillers, like you were saying. Um, there's this juxtaposition between good and bad. And the idea of suspense and finishing off a book. Mm -hmm. um, so, w how do you manage to finish off a book? You know, you've got all this wonderful content, these gorgeous one-liners, these fantastic mm -hmm. codes, and so much beautiful visuals. How how do you pass all that up and say, right, I'm done. That's it. That it's difficult, and I've watched a lot of thrillers and films that that help me see how how a really great director constructs mm. that because because writing a thriller is very different from from writing a Clarice Bean novel for instance and um, so it's got it's got to keep you on the edge of your your seat and it's got to build and I always think suspense in a thriller is I've, I've sort of learned from watching a lot of Hitchcock films and also Quentin Tarantino films that what they're both extremely good at is bringing in the domestic. So you have lots of scenes that are quite cosy and safe. Um, Spielberg yes. also does yes. this brilliantly in a film like Jaws um, and even E.T., where you have these lovely quiet moments where you really get to know your characters and you feel quite safe and you, and you lean and in. And you care about them. Yeah. That's the really important thing. So you really then mind whether you know the guy in jaws the police guy you know <laughs> he you don't want him to get eaten it really matters that he doesn't get eaten or his children don't get eaten by that shark so when you're there with that character and then something bad happens you're you're feeling more alarmed than if it began like that and you didn't know the character so the better you know the characters in the, in ruby redfall the more you're going to mind um, 
So I try and go from from the quiet moments to something quite alarming happening and then then you kind of ease off again and it keeps building and building and building until you so get you're to the invested end. in the characters. so you're really invested in the yeah. characters and hitchcock does that beautifully by using a lot of comedy as well because you yeah, you can't true. help but laugh at a moment but that makes it doubly scary then when something bad happens it's almost like a personal sieve actually you're kind of sipping through all these little things and picking away it's you kind mm. of um tap it it's like an accessing some mm. sort of emotional memory i think yeah. isn't it from yeah sort of the past and finding out you know how to implement this into the book yeah but i believe you have a lovely extract for us i do as and well i was, to read yeah i have a little bit which hopefully sort of describes um a little bit of what i'm talking about in that um this is right at the end of um it's catch all death and it's book three in the series. And Ruby um, has just done this incredible... You can see how close to the end it is, just a few pages from the end. But not to give too much and, away, hopefully. Well, I hope <laughs> we'll not. We'll see. But um, just to explain, um, Ruby has been... Um, has realised that, you know, she has to rescue her best friend Clancy, who's been held hostage up on Wolfpaw Mountain. And she needs to get him down because he's going to be murdered. And um, she also, in the process, has to release the blue Alaskan wolf, which is, which has been um, captured by these dreadful villains who are going to extract this scent from it, which is worth a fortune. And this is the last blue Alaskan wolf. So she sets it free. She's rescued her friend. There's a forest fire coming in. Um, <laughs> And so they have to take the really perilous way down the mountain. So it's the really steep side of the mountain. They have to Wonderful. get down there in the nick of time before they get burnt to cinders. And, um, and she is able to do this because she's wearing her special Bradley Baker sneakers, which have got this amazing capacity to cling to the cliff. And as they, as they come down... Um, this the steep side of the cliff, you know, right at the end, they they then tumble the last few yards, and um, she loses the sneakers. It's fine though; she doesn't care because there is this woman down just just a few feet away, who's parked in a little layby. She's she's got her camper van. She's going to drive them out of there. Ruby's sure of it. And there's this woman. She looks very homely and friendly. Clancy, meanwhile, really minds about the sneakers. So he's gone off to find the sneakers so he's rummaging around in the in the um, shrubbery looking for those and and ruby ruby sort of tumbles down the last part of the the, the cliff to meet this woman and say please rescue us help you know drive us back to twinford and lo and behold the woman is not what we what we think, think she is and she is this cutthroat Australian murderess and she really really wants to kill Ruby will there be an Australian accent there will <laughs> be an Australian read. accent so, <laughs> so um, although Ruby's American there is this there Lovely. is this terrifying um, woman there who who basically wants to kill Ruby she doesn't know however that Clancy Crew is is a seeing watching so um, this is the tiny bit the woman aimed the gun at Ruby's heart and Ruby instinctively stepped back one pace, two, and into thin air. She didn't fall far, ten feet maybe, onto a ledge about six foot square, a sheer drop behind her, a sheer rock face in front, and the way she felt the pain shoot through her, a possible broken arm. Now injured and without her Bradley Baker shoes, how was she ever going to climb, up or indeed down? The woman peered over the cliff edge to where Ruby lay sprawled and then looked beyond the approaching flames. We don't want to be here, sweetie. Don't you know? There's a forest fire heading this way. It's going to get real dangerous real quick. She reached into her purse and took out a box of matches. And you know what forest fires are like. Once one gets going, they sort of spring up everywhere. She struck the match and dropped it into the long grasses by her feet. I guess I better get going if I'm going to make it out of here unscathed. There just is no predicting nature. She smiled at Ruby. Don't 
You don't mind if I save my bullets, do you, sweetie? Ashes to ashes and all that. She turned and Ruby watched as she disappeared, heard the engine rev and the car speed away. Ruby looked into the flames and saw her number was up. Clancy had seen it all, the woman and Ruby, but he had watched enough thrillers to know, wait until the villain has left the stage. Ruby had a rule about it, one she'd shared with him and which he'd often thought about. Rule 10. Never reveal your hand to a psychopath. And so that was the idea I got from watching all these movies where when the, the arch villain appears, the character gives themselves away. Yes. And instead of bluffing it out and pretending, you know, everything's fine, they, they always say, it's I know sinister. who you are. Yes. It's great. I love it. But it, And also, Clancy being on the peripheral, yeah. he can see what's going on. Yeah. It's all very, oh, it's fantastic. Yep. Um, Catch Your Death, I mean, you know, that was the extract you just read from. The titles of the books, of each book of the series, are great. They're gorgeous. They're, they, they really work on their own, but also they work as a series, which I love. Um, how easy was it for you to come up with them? Um, oh, it's always hard coming up with the title. That must be the hardest bit, surely. It's In really hard. Ways. Because originally I wanted them to really reflect the six senses so they were mm. all meant to be so that's why that first one was called look into my eyes because it it it's said in the book by a very sinister person and it's also about what ruby has to do in order to figure something out and then i thought about it and i thought you know what i want to make them sound like thrillers and so feel the fear was is about ruby uh, it, which is book four it's really about Ruby having to engage with her sense of fear and in this book she's not feeling fear she's fearless and being fearless is quite a dangerous thing to be so that was where that came from Catch Your Death is something that Ruby's housekeeper Mrs Digby says to Ruby she's you know, great and she she's says, a great character you know, you're going to catch your death and, and it has that lovely sort of sinister overtone um, which yeah. I really wanted. Um, we mustn't forget also that there are some fantastic audiobooks that have also been recorded by Rachel Sterling, who does oh, an wonderful, plethora yeah. of beautiful accents, yeah. fabulous <laughs> characters. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to throw that in as well. Yeah. It's important you know, she's to highlight amazing that talent. Because it's, it's so difficult for Rachel because there it's a cast of a thousand. You know, there's so many it's an incredible characters, of characters. And she has to remember who they all are and what their voices are like. So it's not easy. It's, well, I, and actually, I was quite um, taken in by your Australian accent. So I think <laughs> you're for money with the Australian accent, for sure. Um, we're also here to celebrate uh, the new jackets, the new book jackets for Ruby. Um, they are beautiful. They're eye-catching. I've got some here. They're up on the on the monitors now. Um, how did the idea come about for these, these new covers? Because they are um, so vivid. Well... It was because for, for the hardbacks, I really wanted a very sort of retro feel. I wanted these books to look like they might have been around for a long time. And so I wanted that comic strip yes. feel. And for them to be... It's very be, pop art almost. It's, it's very yeah. pop art. And it's also based on those sort of old movie posters that I always loved. And there's an illustrator called Saul Bass, oh, who's done some wonderful film work. Titles. Yeah, he did yeah. a lot of stuff for Hitchcock. And then also Catch Me If You Can, which um, is a wonderful film as well, which it, he, he did the title sequence, which is beautiful. And I wanted it to have that, that feeling like this is a book that perhaps was written a long time ago because they're set in the 70s. Um, but then for the paperbacks, we thought it might be rather nice if you get some sense of who Ruby is. And... Um, so we looked for um, a model that might play Ruby mm. and just to have parts of her face appearing. And so although, you know, there are, there are things about her that might not um, be someone else's vision, it's always very difficult when you show um, a photograph of a character because it, it might disturb someone else's idea yes. of what she looks yes. like. Um, she 
to me, to my mind, she'd have much, much darker hair. But it sort of doesn't matter because she's she's there to sort of just give a sense of that character to help you identify with her. So that was really why we did it. But you could equally do them all over again with a different girl, you know. So it's it's what's in your head that really counts. I love the fly as well, and I've noticed that you put a little hair clip. I have in, got the ruby hair clip, which, is gorgeous. which we are producing for the next book. Great. So that's going to be some. a freebie with the next book. But um, no, I, I'm, I'm really happy with these covers because it was it was just sort of a way of bringing her into reality a little bit more. Yeah, into the forefront yeah, yeah, slightly. Yeah. Well, they're beautiful. Um, we've also got some questions now mm -hmm. from some kids who've been furiously emailing in and typing up questions for you. Um, so the first one is from Lindisfarne Middle School. Uh, where did the uh, where did you get the ideas for the names? Where did the ideas for the in the in the book come from? Well, it's a very good question because I can't write a character until I get their name, and even really? the street name. You know, everything's mm. got to be um, fairly sure in my head. So um, the names. Uh, somebody mentioned to me it's so long ago that I came up with the name Clancy Crew that I really can't remember whether I I um, knowingly called him Clancy Crew because of Nancy Drew. There's a, there's <laughs> a very good. famous book Stopping series. The cap, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's a very famous uh, um, detective, child, uh, well, teenage detective yeah. called Nancy Drew. And I suspect that probably I did do it knowingly, but I can't remember anymore. <laughs> and then, but I know this was not on purpose. Um, but Hitch, the name for Hitch, who's, who's Clancy's mentor, really. He, he, he's, he's sort of undercover as the Ruby Redfort butler or house manager. But actually he's head of, you know, he's a very, very key person in the, in the secret agency spectrum that, that Ruby works for. But someone said, did you call him Hitch because of Hitchcock and your love of Hitchcock? I suspect subliminally I did I was going to say I, I, the but, subconscious. Yeah, like, subconscious. In. Yes, yeah. I think it probably was. Um, King Edward Camphill School. Um, who was the inspiration for the character Ruby Redfort? I know we've touched on that slightly, but yeah, we touched on it as as um, from from characters uh, that Jodie Foster might have yes. played and her kind her way of talking and. Um, but I think she also represents for me those those children that I knew at school who are perhaps friends of mine that I rather wanted to be like, whether they were boys or girls. Um, I had I had um, friends who were girls and friends with who were boys who had that kind of magnetism, and I always think it's it's such an amazing thing to have, which is that that ability not to mind too much about what people think about you think of you so you you don't get swayed by i had a, i had a friend for example who who would listen to whatever music he wanted to listen to and he would wear whatever clothes he wanted to wear and he didn't worry it about doesn't matter whether people thought he was uncool yeah. or it wasn't quite the right thing to be doing and i think because of that Nobody did criticise him because he was so at one with himself. So I was trying to create a character a bit like that. I think that's a really lovely starting point, actually, because mm. there are a lot of kids that probably feel that they can't be themselves or that yeah, they want to I sort was of... tortured by that, trying to look right. Um, and it, it's such a shame because you don't really need to be exactly. worrying about what everyone thinks about you. It's true. Um, Barnhill Community High School... Will the personalities of Ruby and Clancy ever change as they get older? That's a good question. Well, in a sense, although we we really only cover one year of Ruby's life, and because all of these stories take place in one one sort of year, but it's that thing that they always talk about in stories and in films, which is their hero's journey. So, where is what is Ruby's starting point as a person? And where is she going to end in terms of her wisdom and her courage? Well, we know Ruby starts with, an, with, with almost too much courage and with almost too much confidence. A lot of gumption yes. at the start. And I think what Ruby's going from is a girl who's incredibly tough and, and secure in herself 
to someone who has to sort of start questioning part of her part of her sort of sureness and and learn and she's going from from someone who's actually I guess she's she's going from huge ego to realizing that she needs to lose a bit of that ego mm. and let go a bit and listen a bit more so that's her journey I think to sort of filter down to what to a real wisdom yeah exactly yeah. Um, St John's Marlborough and Bucky High School have asked together the same question how did you come up with the idea for Ruby Redfort and how did you come up with the idea for Clancy Crew? We've, okay. we've concentrated on Ruby but yeah. Clancy is definitely someone that I would love to find out a little bit more about as well. Yeah well I think Clancy is is really that friend that everyone should have which is somebody who is entirely loyal and um it's a sort of, I think it's it's just the holy grail of friends mm. almost because loyalty really is 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 key with a friendship. You've got to be able to trust that person, not sell you down the river, and he never will. And there's 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 quite a lot of quotes in the books about how you know you could dangle him over a pit of crocodiles and he will never give you away. So he won't ever give away a confidence or betray you he won't give away information he won't give away information he good won't friend. back chat about you he's entirely loyal to you and i i really wanted to write about someone like that because every hero mm. needs somebody there to really back them up and yeah and it's good for the protagonist in a way to have that yeah. to have that sort of sidekick it's a and useful that personality foil. yeah right it must really be useful. so writing that as you're saying it's very useful to have those personalities yeah. sometimes hand in hand yeah that, must be a really lovely way to punctuate the stories. Yeah, so you can have these great moments. And so I can use him as a plot device um, in the books because every time something happens and she's not not quite sure um, of how she's going to get out of a, of a terrible fix, we, the reader, know that Clancy, if he can help, he will help. So if he knows something, he will make sure that the right person knows or he will go and rescue her himself he'll do whatever it takes so we know that and that gives us that nice kind of warm feeling um which you always need that in a thriller you don't want to feel your your protagonist is completely alone yeah no that's a very good point actually uh meadowlark christian school um have asked a few a few questions here which are great um what is your favorite ruby red fort book Okay, that's always a hard one because usually it's the it's the latest one yes. in the series. And um, although this was just such a hard book to write because I was really up against time, and it, and so it didn't make it fun to write because I was so anxious. But actually, when I read back, it's quite nice to see how how it how actually it, came together because yeah, it feels it like magic began. to me now. But does it still feel like that to you? It does, really, really? because I, it, I've forgotten the agony and I've forgotten <laughs> how difficult it was. But And I'm thinking, gosh, how did I write that? I can't really remember. But I think what I enjoyed about writing this book was the parkour, which I I know I that's love. a big... I, I love, love parkour. <laughs> <laughs> Say that at the same so, time. We both love it. Yes. So, I, so I, I, I watched a lot of parkour and I actually met with a sort of parkour practiser. Did you? And she, she was brilliant to talk to and she she explained the philosophy of it because it's a sort of mindset and it's about your mind being very much in tune with your body and um and there's a wisdom to parkour as well it's not about taking um crazy risks it's actually about harnessing risk and thinking no, it's about strategy about and, and strategy. trying to work out yeah how best to figure out how to yeah. leap and bound exactly. and um, no, it's wonderful. Mm. Did you ever try it? I, I didn't, and and she she was trying to persuade me to um, come along because they do all these parkour classes, and I really meant to, and and it was a it was just a problem of time. I just didn't have any time to do anything. That's uh, something to, to yeah. put on the list. But she, sure. I mean, she she says you can do parkour at any age, and and it's and it's very good for you as well. Physically, it's very good for your body. Fantastic. Um, what will the next book be about? The next book is going to be about uh, taste. That's the sense. Mm -hmm. So it's another hard one for Marcus. <laughs> and we've got to He'll come up. To and it. obviously smell and taste have, are quite linked. Yes. So we have to come up with another way of doing a code which is taste related. 
So um, I'm not quite sure what we're doing actually at the There's moment. nothing it, else. Yeah, yeah, don't give away too much. Yeah. I think that's that's a great answer. I think I'm really, really intrigued to find out more about it. Uh, what other things can the escape watch do? And who does the Count work for? And what is he doing? You can ask uh, that together, probably. Yes, well, the escape watch, Ru Ruby has a number of gadgets that most of them she's she's unintentionally or intentionally borrowed from Spectrum. And the escape watch she's actually been given. Um, and it has so many functions because the wonderful thing about being the writer is that whenever it suits you, you can add a function to that watch. So if we had to make it today, we know that it has this amazing titanium cable that shoots out and can grab things and is uh, and can lift Ruby out of situations. Yes. How it works, I don't know. But I don't have <laughs> to worry about that. And it has a laser device and um, it has a transmitter, radio transmitter, and it does lots and lots of things. It's necessary for it sometimes to break because otherwise we would always think she can always get out of there oh, with the with the watch. So so sometimes you have to get rid of your gadgets in yes. order to put your hero on the spot. But yeah, the 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 watch can do so many things and hopefully more in this book. Um the count. Well, that's the big mystery. We don't know who the count's working for and we don't know why he's working for that person and what he's what he's gaining from it. Um, so hopefully that will all be resolved by the final book, book six, we hope is the final book. So um, that that's the plan. So stay tuned. Stay tuned. Yeah. Um, final question. Uh, will Bradley Baker turn out to be alive? Please let him, exclamation mark. I love <laughs> that someone wants him to be alive. It's really, really nice. I would be crazy to tell you what's going to happen, so I'm not going to. So, sorry. Well, actually, that's quite a good answer to yeah. end on. I think that's all we have time for. Um, I want to say, it's Lauren, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show talking to me about these wonderful books and your work and your career. Um, wish you all the luck in the world with the new book. Thank you. Um, it sounds really great. And thank you for everybody who's tuned in um, and watched us. For anyone that's missed out, um, there is also an audio podcast on the Books Podcast, which is um, a books podcast with authors and their interviews and it's available on SoundCloud and iTunes and it will go up later on today so that's really exciting for everyone to listen to um, Lauren thank you once again for oh, coming thank Wonderful. you thank you